excellent so i think you should have all just got a notification saying that this meeting is being recorded um so we'll turn that off before the q a all of our slides are on the osf um we'll upload all of our presentations after the meeting as well and we'll give the link in the chat and the q a so you can access all the slides great um, so just some ground rules. Um, we're all early career researchers and our take is just one perspective and one experience. There will be things that we don't cover, things that have happened to other people and haven't happened to us. So I'd recommend seeking out more voices on the subject, but we only have 90 minutes. So we're just going to cover mainly our experiences and what we know, but just know that they're not necessarily representative of everyone doing this work. Um, and please be respectful of others abuse in the chat or harassment won't be tolerated and you'll just be kicked out so please don't do that because <laughs> i will kick you out you can stay in the workshop for as little or as long as you like if you need to dip in and out that's also fine we'll make sure that we're watching the waiting room as we go through to let people in and out and you can have your videos on and off we really don't mind whatever is most comfortable for you and like i said questions will be at the end of the talks cool okay <laughs> so are there any questions before i start my presentation I think we're good. Um, but yeah, so we're going to go through these four presentations, um, which will have different aspects of public engagement. And then we're going to go through a more general Q&A. So throughout the presentations, it'd be great if you could have a think about what kind of questions you want to ask, what discussions you want to have with the wider group. So in my presentation, I'm going to be talking about working with policymakers, both as an insider and an outsider. So who am I? My name's Anea Prosser. I'm a second year PhD student at the University of Bath, and I work in social, moral, and environmental psychology. Um, I'm also the SIPAG representative for the BPS social psychology section. So if we have any social psychologists in the room, hello. <laughs> it's good to have you here. Um, if you have any ideas for how you want social psychologists to be better represented in the BPS, also get in touch with me to discuss that, I'm happy. Um, yeah, it's a really cool job, so I'd really recommend it. And so I've worked with policymakers both to gain additional income during my PhD and also to gain research experience in different areas. In terms of my career ambitions, I'm hoping to go on to an academic career, but I'm definitely not 100% wedded to it. And I wanted to get a bit more experience of what jobs there are available. So that was really important to me. And I also wanted to see how environmental research can have a real world impact. Um, because for anyone working in environmental social science, you'll know that most of our work is applied and needs to have impact to really change the climate crisis, basically. So it's pretty fundamental for us that we work on research engagement and impact. So if I go to my next slide. So in terms of my experience working with policymakers, I'm going to talk about two primary experiences I have today. One is as an outsider. So this is when I was working as, a dem as an academic with an uh, external organization on a project. And the other one is as an insider. So where I was working as a researcher within an external organization. So as an outsider, I was working with Bath and Northeast Somerset Council on a project examining um, public's um, perception of the clean air zone, which is a very controversial policy that limits the amount of driving that you can do in a city center. And as an insider, I worked on the research initiative with the all party parliamentary group on the Green New Deal. And this was a three month project kind of examining how society can adapt after COVID. Um, so two very different experiences, but I'm hoping that I have tips from both of them that will help you if you want to engage with policymakers in either one of these ways. So in terms of the clean air zone implementation project, so this was developed in collaboration with the University of Bath and Bath and North East Somerset Council. So we kind of wrote up the grant together and then it was funded by the council. And this was primary research. So we did a bunch of interviews, we did some surveys and that kind of thing. And this project lasted for nine months, which <laughs> felt very fast at the time. And nine months is very fast for an academic project. Um, we all know that academic projects are usually very slow. Um, we went nine months from starting to having the final report as well. So just be aware that when you work with policymakers, you will be working on a much faster timescale than you are potentially used to if you've only worked as an academic. So in terms of the priorities for people working on the outside with organisations, I would say one thing that's really important is to manage expectations on both sides. And this theme will come up a lot in the rest of my talk as well. I think there were a lot of 
there were a lot of occasions where we thought we were speaking the same language and we really weren't. And um, policymakers thought we could do stuff much faster than we actually could. And we thought that the policymakers would want to do stuff in a particular way, and they really didn't. So kind of making sure that we were having constant conversations about what we wanted and what we could achieve in the time that we had, and with the funding that we had as well, was really important throughout. Um, it was really important to maintain a positive relationship. So kind of working together and bending, but not breaking, being aware of what our um, boundaries were as academics, what we needed to achieve for our own goals and what we needed to achieve for the council's goals. So this kind of like symbiotic, like push and pull relationship was really important. And we had to clarify the output and the timeline quite a lot because when you're working with policymakers, different events can change timelines. So for example, when I was working on the Clean Air Zone project, um, COVID hit and the Clean Air Zone was delayed because um, all of the funding ran out and stuff like that. So these things can happen in a way that in academia are more rare. Um, so just constantly clarifying what your desired output is and what the timeline is and what is most helpful for researchers might not be helpful at all for policymakers. So as researchers, we'll often be thinking about uh, what we are going to publish, but a published journal article is rarely of importance to policymakers. What they really want is a document with recommendations about what they should immediately do to have impact. So clarifying those expectations were really important. And making sure the project keeps to budget. Budget management is really important when you're working with external partners because you need to have advance notice if you require more money to be able to manage those expectations. So this is kind of my experience. It was very good. Um, but yeah, again, the communication was really key throughout to make sure the project worked. And as an insider, like I said, I worked with the all party parliamentary group on the Green New Deal. This the group was funded by a variety of different sources. So my boss actually had to go to different stakeholders and ask for different pots of money to be able to like print the reports and like do lots of different bits of research so it was a lot more varied and my role was actually funded by the southwest doctoral training partnership and if any of you are funded phd students um a lot of doctoral training partnerships will offer funded policy placements and i think chris actually did one of those as well I think Naomi did something similar with the Royal Institution, which she's probably going to talk about. Um, so if you're interested in working outside of academia, going to your doctoral training partnership or doctoral college is a really good place to get funding to allow you to do that work. And in this, we polled um, a bunch of people about what they wanted to happen after COVID. We did some focus groups and we also did a policy review of what the policymakers and non-governmental organisations were saying about um, what we should do after COVID. And I worked on the Clean Air Zone project first, and that was nine months, and it felt like it was running at breakneck speed. But then I immediately went into this project, and I had three months from the beginning of the project to producing two massive policy reports. So just know that when you're working as an insider compared to working as an academic, your timeline will be even shorter, and you're really expected to work hard to meet all of these deadlines. So in terms of the priorities when you're working as an insider, this, this time to deliverables is really, really important. Knowing what you're going to be able to deliver and when is so important. Knowing that you'll be able to have one report by a certain date is fundamental for ensuring that stakeholders stay um, engaged, that funders stay engaged. Um, it's a lot more important than it is for academics who can get a bit more of a free reign when it comes to their funding. As long as they complete a report by the end of their funding period, it's usually fine. Whereas as an insider, the relationship between myself and my stakeholders was a lot more like engaged throughout. So you really need to be constantly communicating with them. Um, reporting to superiors and stakeholders as well. Um, yeah, like I said, um, academics get a lot more free reign, whereas as an insider, I was expected every day to be reporting to someone about what I was doing. And I actually found that for me, that was not the way that I preferred to work, which is why I like working in academia, because you get a bit more flexibility. Um, but if you're someone that prefers a bit more direction, then this might be really good for you and it might be a career path that you want to consider. Um, as well, um, media coverage is really important for insiders. And I won't go on about this too much because I know Chris is going to talk about it. And then looking at pinch points. So the, working around the events that you can and can't control because policy is affected by politics, which of late <laughs> is literally all over the place. So yeah, you have to be very responsive and very agile in the way that you work. 
So in terms of when you start a collaboration, I've got a few key questions that you need to ask yourself. First one is, do you want to do this? Just if, if it's not an enthusiastic yes, it's a no. Working with policymakers can be quite difficult and you need to be fully engaged from the beginning. And it's okay to not want to do this. That's also fine. But just ask yourself the question in your heart, like, do you really want this? Next question is, why are we doing this? What's our main objective and does it align with our partner? Because if your objective is completely different to your partner's, there's going to be some issues there. What are the main benefits to our partner and our research team? Do we have the time to commit to this fully? And if yes, how, we, how will we protect that time over the course of an academic year? Can we make sure that we don't take up extra like teaching or marking commitments? And if we don't have time, can we work effectively on this project with, with the time that we have? Again, if the answer is no, it's okay to decline a collaboration. That's fine. Just make sure that if you're going to do it, you fully commit from the outset. And what will happen if we lose a team member? Um, so I think it's really important to kind of see your team as a bit more fluid when you're working with collaborations, making sure that the power amongst your team is divided equally, knowing that if your supervisor leaves, what will happen is really important for the organization because it means that they can continue to, tr to trust your research team, even if the one core person leaves. So I'd recommend having that discussion. Um, key questions to ask your partner. Um, again, these are quite similar. Why do you want to work with us? What do you expect us to achieve? Do you have expectations of the results of our work? Because as academics, we can often say, we don't know what's going to happen, it'll be fine. But as policymakers, they might have a vested interest in a particular result, and you need to make that clear that um, that's not the way that academia often works. Um, and you need to consider how you would respond if the um, partner wants a particular kind of result out of your work. And do you want this work published in an academic journal? And what will happen if we need to change the project in some way? So all of this is to say, my main piece of advice is when you're working with policymakers, make your assumptions explicit. And I've got a very niche language joke here, which is um, Dutch and German are very similar languages in that if you're a German speaker, you can probably speak a lot of Dutch. And similar, if you're Dutch, you can probably speak a bit of German, but they are different languages. And so if you're an academic, you can probably work with policymakers, but you need to be aware of where your languages differ. So here are some examples. Policymakers might be more interested in percentages than inferential statistics, reports more than publications, practice more than theory, immediate impact instead of prolonged peer review, intellectual property instead of open science is something you might want to consider. And we can talk about that a bit more in the discussion plain language instead of jargon, and consultation data is not always clean data. <laughs> the way that um, policymakers collect data might be very different to what you're used to as an academic. So just clarify that when you start. So to conclude, working with policymakers can be a great way to ensure that your, your research has impact and for you to gain extra experience and income while you're working on the PhD, but communication is key so always establish and assert your boundaries before and during a partner project. And if you want some further reading, I've written two papers about this, which you can access on Sci Archive, and I'll put these papers up in the OSF folder as well for you all to access afterwards. So I think I went a little bit over time, <laughs> but I hope that was helpful if I stop sharing my screen. Um, I don't think we have time for questions. So if we move straight on to Chris and then any questions for my talk, I'll take um, at the end. Um, great. So Chris, if you want to go ahead. Fantastic. Well done, Anaya. That was uh, really useful. And uh, yeah, I think that a lot of the things that you mentioned there, I will echo in my presentation as well. If I can work out how to share my screen. Here we go. Um, could somebody give me a shout to let me know my slides are showing up? Yeah, it looks like it's working. Yeah, it's fine. Fantastic. Great. Okay, thank you. Well, yes, uh, so I'm Chris Bryant. I actually finished my PhD uh, last year, about a year ago. Uh, and since then, I have been a research consultant, uh, self-employed and working with a number of nonprofits and also alternative protein companies, uh, which is the area where I did my PhD. Um, so I'll give a little bit of background about myself, first of all, and my path to consulting. Um, so my PhD was at the University of Bath, as I said, finishing last year. Um, during this time, uh, I 
I, I don't know if I was consciously doing this at the time, but looking back on it, I was doing an awful lot of presenting at conferences and being very proactive uh, in terms of networking and taking business cards at those conferences as well, um, which turned out to be very useful. I mean, it is true that most of the people that you meet at these events, you will never speak to again, um, but you never know who will be the few useful contacts who go on to be very, very uh, useful contacts in the future. Um, so I did some informal paid and unpaid consulting uh, and general collaborations during my PhD. Uh, I think this was a really important thing for me to have done uh, because basically I think it's good advice that if you hope to do some job in the future, to whatever extent you can, to just start doing it. Um, because, well, I mean, in self-employment, I guess that you just start doing it. But when you're employed by somebody else, if you start taking on the tasks of another job, then when it comes time to promote somebody into that position, you'll be the person who already knows how to do the job. Uh, so basically start doing uh, consulting and collaborations as early as you can. Uh, and some of those relationships could develop into something more long term. Um, so I now have formalized that consulting work through my company, Brian Research Limited, uh, which I have been doing for about a year now. So one of the main things that I was asked to talk about today was getting clients. Uh, it's, yeah, obviously kind of one of the main uh, challenges here is uh, how to attract people who are going to pay you to do research projects for them. Well, first of all, I would say most of my work and most of my paid work has come through word of mouth, people that I have met, people that know, people I've worked with. Um, so it, you know, they say it's not what you know, but who you know. Of course, it is what you know in research consulting, but it is also who you know. Um, and if some if somebody's reason to pick you over some established kind of company that does this kind of thing um, is going to come down to your niche knowledge of the area, but will also come through recommendations if other people know that you've done good work in this area. Uh, so word of mouth, networking, and collaborations are very, very important for getting for getting clients. If you can get published, uh, if you can get popular articles published, of course, far easier said than done, uh, then that could be a good way to be discovered by potential clients. And another thing to consider doing, and uh, I guess that some of the other speakers will, will speak about this, is more kind of mainstream outreach. Uh, if you can write articles for the conversation, uh, that sort of thing, uh, which will enable you to get in front of a broader audience. And people will discover you through those publications and some of those people will end up paying you. Uh, give yourself a professional front. So yeah, this, this feels like kind of uh, self-aggrandizing a little bit awkward to do to set, you know, it, at least it did for me. It felt like uh, a little bit pretentious to be setting up a company called My Surname Research Limited, uh, but it has been really useful. I mean, if you put that image of yourself out there, then clients and other people will take you at face value and will treat you as if you're a professional. So if you have a, a website with your name on it, company name, headshot, that kind of thing, uh, that will go a long way to, to people taking you seriously and, and wanting to pay you for jobs. So wherever possible, it's great to get into arrangements where you set up an ongoing retainer agreement uh, with a client. Oftentimes they'll want you to do one project, which is kind of you know a defined period. And once it's done, it's done. But if you can get into an arrangement where you're giving them advice on an ongoing basis or helping them with projects on an ongoing basis, then you can get regular pay and that can be really useful for stabilizing your income, which otherwise can be um, erratic if you're self-employed. So if you can get into these retainer agreements with a regular monthly payment, it's really helpful. Um, and grants continue to be an important source of funding. So when you set up as a private company, as opposed to a you know, student at a university, you can still have access to the kind of grants that academics apply to. Um, there may be specific grants in your area. There are lots of effective animal advocacy things which I apply to, which are relevant to my area. So find out what those are in your area and know that you don't have to be at a university to be applying for those lots of funding. So I'm going to go over three main tips with respect to consulting. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll start out tip number one, know the difference between academic research and consulting. So I think that I'm going to echo, echo a lot of the things that Anaya said in this section. 
really academic research puts a lot of emphasis on inferential statistics, t-tests, ANOVAs, p-values, this kind of thing. That stuff is quite meaningless to non-academics, okay? Anybody who doesn't have a master's degree is not going to understand when you're talking about, they may be able to follow something like, you know, x is significantly more than y, but they're not really going to know what that means. And certainly if you start talking about mediation analyses and p-values, most people do not know what you're talking about and they don't want to hear things that they don't understand. So just keep that in mind when you're doing consulting. It's much better to express things in terms of just simple percentages, simple graphs. These people want your job to be just descriptive statistics <laughs> in many ways. Uh, again, as Anaya said, uh, academic research much more focused on, on theory, uh, developing and testing hypotheses. Whereas in consulting for uh, private companies or for NGOs, Really, there's two main aims that they might have. The first, which I assumed would be the main target, is kind of aiding with strategic decision making, right? We can test out different messages, see which one performs the best, and then you'll know that these are the messages to use. And then the second thing, which I think is actually a very big value add, is generating media attention, right? If there can be a st you know, new study finds that such and such intervention is effective for reducing whatever, that can become a whole media event for this organization who otherwise might have paid thousands to advertise in a newspaper, right? Now they can have a whole news cycle, uh, study finds that this event, that this intervention was effective or whatever, and it doesn't cost them any advertising dollars. So that is again, something that private companies will want to uh, prioritize when you're doing consulting. And again, as Naya said, projects are going to be much quicker rather than lasting years as academic projects do, they're more likely to last a matter of months. You'd be expected to work on tighter deadlines, that kind of thing. So my second tip uh, uh, to expand on that point is to get media coverage of your research. You can, after you publish a study, you can write a press release. So just a one page Word document that kind of summarizes the main findings in very relatable, understandable, palatable, digestible terms, and then you can send those press releases out to journalists. And if you're lucky and get some nibbles, journalists will write much more mainstream articles, which will get many, many more views than your scientific publication will hope to get uh, and, and be very useful for your clients in that way. Um, so if you do this, you, could, you should be prepared to have interviews either on broadcast uh, media or in print media. Print is going to be generally easier because oftentimes they'll just ask you questions by email. You can have a lot of time to think over them. They may want to get you on a call and obviously for broadcast interviews, it will be live or recorded and then rebroadcast, but you'll be answering the questions you know, in real time. Um, really the advice for dealing with media in a kind of live setting is to have two or three talking points that you want to get across and kind of whatever they ask you, acknowledge it and then pivot to your talking points. Basically, that is what you want to do. You're only going to get a 10 or 15 second soundbite or a one line quote in the news article. So you want to make sure that you say, get said the main things that need to be said. Know your talking points. OK, same, same point there. Use your university's press office. The, the press office at the University of Bath has been so useful for helping me to put together press releases, send them out to journalists. And they also have access to things which us mere mortals don't have access to, which are things like Eureka Alert, Science Alert, those kind of uh, uh, scientific journal news wires. Uh, so they get blasted to a bunch of journalists at the same time. And then my final tip is to form collaborations proactively. So as I said, collaborations can be a valuable source uh, of valuable relationships. So doing collaborations with people helps to form and strengthen these relationships. And even if you're doing a collaboration which is unpaid, that person might bring you paid work in the future after having a positive experience with you. You can use research groups to meet people that you can do collaborations with. Really, it's a good idea to be proactive in trying to form these collaborations so that you form those valuable relationships. Don't be precious about adding co-authors to your paper. This is, I, from my perspective, this seems to be really good advice. A lot of people seem to have the idea that it's kind of somehow more prestigious if there are fewer authors on the paper. I like to invite people to be a co-author, even if they've made quite a minimal contribution. 
And that has proved to be a valuable strategy in the sense that those people think feel like you're doing them a favor. And in the future, they have the idea in their mind, oh, yeah, we co-authored that paper. Right. I know this person. I can I'm gonna recommend them for uh, for uh, jobs and so on. Sorry, my audio just uh, went a little bit there. Hopefully we're, we're back to good audio now. Um, and then also be relevant on, uh, be active on whatever relevant social media, sharing articles, being known as somebody who is involved in this space. On LinkedIn, they tell you not only how many likes you have, but how many views you have of a post. Um, if you get a good one and share something interesting, it can easily get into the thousands. Thousands of people seeing your name and that you're somebody associated with this area really good way to get yourself out there. So just to recap on those three major tips and I'll uh, pass on to our next presenter, know the difference between academic research and consulting, right? The latter is much more descriptive statistics, much more simple in a sense, and much tighter uh, schedules and deadlines. Get media coverage of your research, use your university's press office or write your own press releases and send them to journalists. Uh, and be proactive in forming collaborations, try to invite people to be co-authors, try to uh, get into kind of team projects with people that might end up being valuable relationships down the line. So that's all I have to say on the topic, but I will look forward to taking your questions at the end of the session. Thanks, Chris. There's one question uh, from Joanne in the chat. Um, can you maybe just answer that in the chat and then we'll go to Alice. Yep. Great, thank you. Um, I will just share my slides. Could you just let me know if you can? Oh, yeah, that's good. Um, yeah, full cool. slides. Okay. Nice. Okay, so a um, bit of a change of pace for this one here. So um, my name is Alice, and um, for my presentation, I'm going to be talking about my experience of involving the public in the sort of running of your research or the design of your research so what we call this is an experts by experience research advisory board or research advisory group i'm just going to refer to it as the team throughout because that's a bit of a mouthful okay uh so um just a bit of background about myself um i am a phd student i'm in my first year and my research is around it's within mental health and it's around the mental health needs of young people whilst they're in care or people who have recently left care and as I began my PhD, I had this sort of realization that although I had worked in uh, mental health, um, both in practice and in research for a few years already, I had never actually directly worked with anybody who was care experienced or a group of people who were care experienced. And so I had this realization that I'm going to have a really steep learning curve um, when it comes to what it feels like to be somebody who is care experienced and seeing as I was the one who was going to be doing research on it, I felt like it was important to actually meet some care experienced people, get to know them and get to know what their experiences are like before I begin my research. Um, so that is why I set up um, my experts by experience research advisory team. And this is essentially a group of people who get together um, occasionally and those people who either lived in care um, well, did live in care and have left care, they talk to me about their sort of experiences of being in care, their opinions about the care system and their views. Um, and I feed that into my research and I hopefully improve my research with their feedback. Um, so my team is uh, made up of around 20 or so care experienced people. We meet once every one or two months, we meet for a one to two hours and they all get paid um, 20 pounds in a voucher for attending the meeting. And what I'm going to talk to you about today is um, my experience of how that went setting up this group. I'm quite early on in my experience of running this group. So a lot of my tips today are going to be around the early stages of setting up your group. Um, and it's also worth saying that there is loads and loads of really good resources out there. So um, go off after my talk if you're still interested and have a read around. I'm also happy to meet with you. Um, but this is purely my experience um, and my tips based on my experience. So. Um, like I said, the purpose of the group is to help shape my research. Um, but when I came and I actually spoke to the people in my team, 
they came up with loads of other reasons for why they were in my care experience advisory team. And that they kind of split up into two reasons. The first being that they wanted to bring around change for care experienced people. So that might be because they wanted to change the research agenda. They wanted to make research better. They wanted to have better research to influence policy, all with the kind of idea that you're gonna be um, improving the lives of people who are care experienced. But there were also all these other reasons why people joined the group. Um, some of them wanted to just build research skills. Um, they wanted, some people had sites on our academic career. Um, and they wanted to meet uh, and network with researchers. Other people just wanted to re meet other care experience advisory people. Um, and some of people just wanted to learn about what research is already happening on um, care experienced people. So um, my first tip for you guys, if you're thinking or considering about um, setting up an advisory team is have a clear purpose for why you want to set up the team, but make sure that that goes beyond what just you as a researcher will get out of it, but also consider why other people might join that team um, and make sure that you can fulfill those needs as well. So you're not just taking, you're also giving. Um, and then when I came to actually setting up my team and I started reading around, um, you know, what should I be doing? Um, I had this realization that actually there's a lot of freedom when it comes to these kinds of things that are outside of research. Um, so then I, I was kind of faced with this thing where I, I knew in theory what I should be doing, um, but I knew that I wasn't going to be sort of there wasn't any ethics board to check what I was doing. Um, my supervisor's loosely involved in what I'm doing and I'm not really being guided. Um, and it's kind of all on you as a, as a researcher or as a PhD student. So I decided to approach my advisory team like I would a piece of research um, where I have a think about the safety um, of my team. And I'm thinking about um, inclusivity and respect and how to build a really safe environment for my team. So the first thing that we did when we set up my team is we set up a team agreement where we all spoke about um, the meeting format, what it would look like, the level of commitment, um, how often we would meet. We had a discussion about safety and how to make sure that we're all protected. So one thing that I did um, is um, I made it so that we have trigger warnings to um, protect my participants, all of my researchers around mental health. So uh, making sure that they're aware of that at the outset and um, and then we also had a discussion about confidentiality. Some people in the team didn't want anybody else to know that they were care experienced. We spoke about inclusivity, so making sure that everybody is heard and also respect for each other's opinions and experiences. And this was kind of split into two things. So we had a, um, a good thing about what I can do as the chair, but also what everybody else can do in the team as well. And I think that's an important thing that you should be thinking about because as a PhD student or as a uh, researcher or an early career researcher, there's often a power imbalance where um, you're seen to be super smart, super experienced, you know what you're talking about, and that can be quite intimidating. Um, so you really have to have a good think about what um, you as a researcher can do, but then also what the team can do for each other. So things like using really clear language, pitching your meetings at an appropriate level, um, having respect for their opinions by accurately representing their opinions without censorship. Okay, so here's my um, next few tips. The first one being set up a team agreement, also set clear expectations for frequency and level of involvement and commitment, and also put in plans like you would with a piece of research, um, which protect the safety and well-being of your team members. And I thought that I wouldn't be a very good PPI researcher if I didn't include the views of my team within this presentation. So I did ask them, um, you know, do you feel comfortable? Do you feel like your views are respected? Do you understand what we're talking about? And I did get 100% agree. So that's really nice to hear. So you'll hear from my, my team a little bit more throughout the presentation. Um, Oh, and also uh, that's just a bit about the format of the meetings. They feel that we meet um, often enough. They think that, oh, they like the format of the meetings. Um, there's mixed opinions on whether or not we meet often enough. And the main piece of feedback that I got from this is actually the meetings aren't long enough. So I think that's quite a nice piece of uh, feedback for me. The next thing that you need to be thinking about is how you're gonna capture the voices of the people in your advisory team. Um, so the way that I do that is I have loads of different ways that I give people the opportunity to share their views. So for example, during the sessions, we have group discussions, but we also use the breakout room so that they can have private discussions and come back to me at the end. We also uh, fill out worksheets throughout the um, presentation, um, which they can send, then send to me after the meeting as well, if they want to add to it. I do one-to-one uh, -one follow up meetings. And then I also do anonymous questionnaires and pro polls throughout uh, the meeting so that those who are a little bit more quiet can also sh share their views. 
And then one other thing that I do is I make this meeting summary, a meeting summary. So there's sort of three reasons that I do this. The first one being that it's a really good record of the decisions that I'm making um, throughout the development of my research. Um, when you're running a care experience advice or when you're running an advisory team, it means that you can make slightly more creative decisions as a researcher um, because you can kind of back up the straight, the unusual decisions that you're making with the fact that well, your advisory team said that this is the best way to do it. So I think that's it's a good record of um, the reasoning for your decision making. Um, also, it helps to keep those who aren't attending the meetings involved. Um, so um, do I have? Yeah, so this piece of feedback here, I asked them, um, do you read um, the uh, meeting summaries? And they all said that they did. And within there were a few people who had never actually attend a meet attended a meeting. So I think it's a really nice way of getting those who are involved, um, who aren't attending the meetings involved anyway, and keeping them up to date with what's going on. And then the final, um, yeah, so, and then, Um, so that's kind of why I did it there. There is another reason, but I can't remember. Oh, I, oh right. The other reason that I do it is because um, it gives people the opportunity to come back and correct anything that I've gotten wrong in the meeting summary. So if I've misunderstood what someone said or I've not accurately represented their view, they can come back via email and say, Alice, actually, I think you need to make this stronger. Or maybe I didn't actually mean that and I can adapt my meeting summary. So it's just like like minutes at the end of the meeting, really. OK, so my next two tips are use a variety of tools to capture the voices and opinions of your group. But then also consider how you're going to keep your uh, members engaged between meetings. So things like meeting summaries can be really good for that. The final kind of two points I want to talk about are, um, are you need to have a really good think about what you're going to use your teams for. So here's a broad list of the sorts of things that people use advisory teams for. The main one that researchers use their advisory um, boards for is to provide feedback on research materials. And I think this is a really good use of a, a research advisory team. Um, you don't really want to send out a questionnaire or do an interview schedule with 30 people or, you know, hundreds of people with a questionnaire if it's not relevant, if it's not sensitive um, or if it's not a good research question. So I understand why people use their advisory team for research materials. But I think you should also consider how you can involve your advisory team across the whole of your research process. So recently um, I had my advisory team help me. Um, broaden my questionnaire. So it was looking at my research materials, but in that conversation about around my questionnaire, we actually added in a couple more research questions um, because they pointed out that I was missing a couple of really important research areas. So think about how you can involve them all the way through. Um, there is a, a researcher called Dawn Monet, who I've not yet, I've yet to meet, but I have read her paper, um, where she got her advisory team really involved in the dissemination of her research findings. So if you have a really applied research question, so for Dawn, she was asking how, about how we can improve the experience of being in school for care experienced people. She came up with a list of um, tips and um, guidance for teachers. And then she got her advisory team to create um, posters and videos, which were then disseminated to loads of schools across the country um, to advise teachers on how to support care experienced people. So in some ways, that kind of work can lead, can for some, you know, sometimes lead to a greater impact than a scientific article. Um, so yeah, um, my main point is just consider how you can evolve your team all the way through. But with that, with that said, it's important also that you consider how you're going to reimburse your participants for their time. Um, and I mentioned at the start that I offer my participants um, 20, a 20 pound voucher for taking part. And when I asked my team, um, do you think that it's a fair amount of money? Um, the majority of them said yes, that they agreed that it was a fair amount of money, but there were a few people in there who felt like it wasn't enough. And I had a good think about how to take this feedback um, and, and sort of how I can improve the situation because the reality is I don't have any more money. I have a certain amount of money that I have from my research training support grant and that's it. So I cannot offer more money and I can't meet more regularly. So I had to think about this and, and I think some of the solutions are these. I think I need to come back and I need to have a think about what the purpose of my meetings are. So you remember at the start, the people are attending, um, my team are attending the meetings because they want to make change. I'm at the start of my advisory team journey. Um, and, um, and so we have mostly been talking about 
developing research questions and designing my research. And so no, I haven't actually got many findings to share with them yet. And therefore I've had no impact. So I think once we um, start actually having some outcomes and once we start working on disseminating findings, that should make people feel a little bit better about their, um, uh, their involvement in the team. Um, I'm also gonna have to think about other non-monetary benefits that I can offer. So for example, is there a particular training, um, a particular research method that they all want training on? Perhaps I can offer some informal training. Um, I would say it's really important at the outset to state your um, benefits for taking part. So the fact that it's a 20 pound voucher and that's it at the start, or if they're gonna be doing it on a voluntary basis, make that really clear at the start so people know what they're signing up for. And that will allow them to weigh up sort of the benefit that they're gonna get out of it um, with the amount of effort that they are putting into it. Um, and just remember at the back of your mind that although your research is your main priority, for the people attending your meetings, your research is not their main priority. They attend for an hour, two hours, once every two months. They barely even think about your research. So just have a really good think about, um, you know, what you're asking to the, them to do. Is it too much? Um, and you can always ask your team. I mean, ask their opinion on whether or not um, the task that you've given them is uh, too much. Okay. So my final two tips are involve your team and um, your team at all stages of your research development. And then also make sure, have a good think about how you're reimbursing your team members time. Um, I think we'll just end on this slide here. Oh, that's a really cringy quote that I meant to take out. Uh, <laughs> and on this slide here, so just say, I've, I've ran maybe six research meetings um, and it's quite good from the tips that I've given you. This is kind of how I do it. And the majority of people seem to enjoy being part of the meetings. They uh, learn from it. Um, they would recommend the team uh, to a friend. Jury's out on whether or not it's an act actually interesting thing to do though. Okay, uh, thank you for listening everybody. Thanks, Alice. That was really interesting. I think that's like, I've never heard of that being done in social psychology. And I think it's such an interesting method. Um, so thanks for sharing. Um, cool. Our last presentation now is from Naomi. And then I think after Naomi's, we'll take a five minute comfort break before coming back to the Q&A. So take it away, Naomi. Great, have I unmuted myself successfully? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Sorry, I'm having difficulties. How do I go back on my, my presentation? Oh, like that. Fantastic. Sorry, everyone. I didn't mean to uh, move on from analysis too quickly by starting sharing my screen. I just knew I would get it wrong. So I was giving myself time to get it all set up. Okay, um, fantastic. So I'm Naomi. I'm a third year PhD student. Um, and I work uh, looking at emotion processing in individuals with anxiety and post-traumatic stress disorder. So my PhD is kind of half clinical, half cognitive psychology. Um, but as well as being very interested in my research, I also have a passion for communicating research to the wider public. So my colleagues have mostly so far talked about public engagement in terms of collaboration with other groups. Um, so how they can work with external organizations or patient groups to co-produce knowledge and shape research and policy. So I'm going to shift the focus a little bit to how we can inform um, the public about our research. So this might be so they can use uh, the knowledge from the research and apply it in their everyday lives, or it might just be purely for their interest or their enjoyment. So I'll just do a quick intro to why I think communicating research uh, is important. So as you guys will all be aware, the primary outcome from our research uh, as academics are academic articles, um, but these obviously actually reach a very limited audience. Uh, not even all academics will read your articles. It'll probably be a very limited number of people who have the same niche interest as you. Um, so how do we get beyond this and actually reach out to those who are most likely to benefit from our research and who are the people who are most likely to bring about change? So how do we also make people believe that research is important? Uh, if, if we don't make any effort to meaningfully communicate our research to the wider public, then we risk research as a whole um, being perceived as pointless, indulgent, irrelevant boffinry, which is one of my favorite quotes ever uh, from Ben Goldacre. Uh, and it's easy to see when the mainstream media is putting out science headlines like this, why people can sometimes get an impression of scientific research as being confusing, inconclusive, and just sometimes plain pointless. Um, and this is a favorite diagram of mine, which, which was published in a newspaper article, which shows according to research, all of the foods that can both cause 
and prevent cancer. So it's our job to uh, increase people's opinion of the importance and trustworthiness of research um, and to put out a different story to that which is being told by the mainstream media. So we can communicate research to the public in so many different ways. And these are just some of the examples that I have seen or have taken part in. So you can really get with, uh, really get as creative as you want with it. And today I'm gonna to tell you the story of how I first became interested in communicating research to the wider public and give you some of my top tips along the way for how you can start getting involved in these kind of activities. I can see more, is stuff happening in the chat that I need to look at? Okay, cool, no. That is, uh, no, it's fine. I'll let you know if it is. I was just checking no one was like, danger, stop, it's not going well or something. Um, okay, cool. Um, so my first tip is to start by getting involved in existing projects and initiatives. So the easiest way to start when you're new to communicating research is to get involved in other people's projects because there are so many public engagement projects already up and running. So you don't need to reinvent the wheel straight away. Getting involved in projects that already exist will help boost your confidence in communicating your research to new audiences and also expose you to a range of different media and activities that you can use to get your research out there. So these are just some of the examples of some of the activities I got involved with um, uh, right off the bat when I was first interested in wider research communication. So one of the first things I did actually was take part in a local science festival called Bath Taps Into Science. Uh, where we created some uh, psychology demonstrations for school children to get them interested in psychology and to give them a, a bit of a broader view of what psychology is, and what psychologists look like. Um, another thing I'd like to flag up, uh, which just shows how broad the different options are for public engagement, is the Global Science Show, which anybody can sign up to. Um, and it's a virtual science festival on Twitter where the organizers assign you a 10 minute slot on a certain day uh, where you can share any content you want about your research. So that might just be tweets, it might be videos, it might be a blog post, um, and that content will be shared and promoted by other scientists around the world. So that's a really good way to uh, build relationships with other people interested in science communication and get that information out there to a really wide audience online. So this kind of feeds into my uh, second tip, which uh, some of the other speakers have already um, covered as well, which is it's really important to establish a social media presence, um, particularly for communicating research to the public rather than sort of collaborating professionally, science Twitter is the big one. I've also had quite a lot of success with Facebook as well. Um, if you have a social media profile right from the start, when you start doing these kind of activities, you can promote and link all of your research communication activities back to one profile, and that will help increase the impact of what you're doing. It's also a really great way to build a network with other people who are interested in science communication and other academics that might want to collaborate with you in creating um, research communication activities. My tip, my third tip would be, don't be afraid to try new things. So it can be tempting to stay in your comfort zone when you're choosing how to communicate your research. But I think that some of the more out there or creative activities are the ones that can actually engage and inspire the most people. So one thing I thought I would never do, um, and not only did I think I would never do it, I was actively against doing it, was stand-up comedy. <laughs> but I actually ended up somehow getting involved in an online comedy panel show uh, about scientific research. Uh, and this is a screenshot of me participating here. Um, and it was actually really fun. It gave me more confidence in my ability to talk freely about my research and to try and make it entertaining. Um, whilst keeping sort of the key facts in there. And I also have made, you know, six new contacts with the other people who were involved in the show that I wouldn't have had before. So although it can be scary to try new things, um, uh, uh, communicating research in really creative ways can really help to boost the level of engagement that you get with people. My fourth tip would be to make the most of university resources when coming up with research communication ideas. And, um, some of these resources have already been mentioned by the other speakers, um, but just to say you may have access to some or all of the following at your institution. So most, institution will most institutions will have a central public engagement unit. 
um, where you can go to with all your questions about public engagement and how to set up different activities. Quite often they'll have learning resources for how to get things going like participant advisory groups or um, how to write articles, how to make videos. Um, they'll be able to tell you about all the funding opportunities that are available. They'll be able to tell you about those existing research communication opportunities like the Global Science Show or local science festivals that you can get involved with. And they're also trained public engagement professionals. So if you have a specific project that you want to run and you're not quite sure how to get it going or how to carry it out, then they can offer advice on specific projects. You might well also be departmental specific public engagement reps or champions that you can go to for this kind of advice as well. And then you might also have access to things like graphic designers. Um, I know we do at the University of Bath who can help you create graphics um, and printed media to communicate your research. The press office, as I think uh, Chris already mentioned, um, is really helpful for handling engagement with the media if you want to talk to journalists or if you want to work with radio or TV or newspapers. And then also uh, most universities will have audio visual equipment available that you can use and perhaps even spaces where you can film and people who can help you create films if you're interested to create video media to communicate your research. So there's basically loads of resources within your university and loads of these resources will be underused. So find out what they are and make the most of them. Uh, and kind of on a related note, uh, my fifth tip is find out where the funding is and use it. So these are just some of the different pots of money that I know of that are available for funding research communication projects. And they're usually chronically underused. So if you have a research communication idea, just find out where the money is and go for it and apply for it. Um, chances are, if you have a good idea, you seem passionate about it and you put a little bit of time into writing an application, that you'll be successful in securing some funding. So in my own case, um, I, started out, I started out in research communication by getting involved in some of those existing projects that I've talked about, like the stand-up comedy and the, the science shows and things. And then once I'd built up a bit more confidence, I was keen to start my own project, which obviously then requires a bit of money. Uh, me and a colleague wanted to run our own website where we could create and collate fun and high quality videos, podcasts and blogs to get people excited about the psychology of perception and cognition. And so we applied for 850 pounds from the SWDTP impact funds, which is our local doctoral training center. Um, and we were successful in securing that funding. Um, so we used this money to start our own website and here's the homepage here. Um, so we used the money to develop and host our website on Squarespace. Uh, we were also able to buy high quality cameras and microphones to create videos and podcasts. And then there was even a bit of money left over for us to run uh, social media campaigns to boost the impact of our, of our um, content and to download cool stock images and things to make our content look, content look really nice. So there is money out there. Um, so just find out where it is and don't be afraid to apply for it. Um, so I'll just show you a little bit more about uh, our website just as an example of what you can create um, when you have the funding to do so. Um, so this is our website www.senselesspsych.com and here's an example of some of our content. So these are some of the podcasts that we've recorded. Uh, we collaborate with academics and do sort of an interview format and get them to talk about aspects of their research that are relevant to every people's everyday lives. Uh, we create blogs um, and then we've also like creating YouTube videos and this is one that my colleague created all about why festivals are good for your brain, uh, which is great. And so my final tip is about the actual content that you create. Um, and I'd say the biggest lesson that I've learned uh, from sort of having a website and creating different types of um, digital media is that uh, a good visual is usually worth a thousand words. Um, so you can spend ages writing the perfect blog post and blog posts are probably my favorite thing to create um, and you can, you know, spend hours making it super concise, informative, but still fun and you will still reach far fewer people than if you just made a short snappy one minute video that uh, portrayed the same message that you were trying to communicate. So to illustrate the power of a good visual, I want to share with you the probably the most successful single bit of public engagement that I ever did which was a Facebook post that I put on Facebook while I was working at the Royal Institution as an intern in their digital team. Uh, so this is just a simple video 
that I recorded with my mobile. So you can see that it's really low tech. So you don't have to use all the high tech equipment and things. Um, so this was just a dem this was just a, um, a demo that was already set up in the Royal Institution for an in-person event. And I made a quick video of this. So this is a robot, a simple robot made out of connects um, solving the Rubik's cube. So it scanned all the faces of the Rubik's cube to work out where all the colors were. And then it uh, solves the Rubik's cube by turning the parts around. And I coupled this with a message about sort of like AI and robots and all the different things that they can help us with in everyday life. Um, and this visual clearly really captured people's imaginations because the post went viral and it had millions of views and over 37,000 reacts. So this is probably one of the pieces of public engagement that I spent the, lo the least time doing. Someone had already prepared something and I just made a quick video on my phone, put it on Facebook with a caption. Um, some things I've spent hours and days doing and they didn't have anywhere near the impact of this. So that just shows you the, the value of a good visual that captures people's imagination. So I just want to end by considering why would we bother doing all of this? So at the start, I kind of considered why it's important from the public's point of view for us to communicate research uh, in a reliable, but fun and entertaining way. But why is it good for us to do it? So I'd say number one, it really helps to improve your communication skills, helps you to learn how to explain your research on a different level, learn how to explain it in clear language and how to explain it quickly and concisely in a way that's relevant. And that not only helps you when you're creating uh, information for sort of the mainstream, but also it has improved my academic writing because I'm now able to see where it's where I can cut out the jargon and cut out the fly, flowery language and keep things concise. Um, it allows you to reach new audiences with your research. People who would never have picked up your academic article now at least have some idea of why your research area is important and relevant to them. Helps you to build your professional networks uh, so, for example, the podcasts that we created with academics, um, they led us to reach out to academics that we would never have connected with otherwise. So now we have an expanded professional network of people who are all interested in science communication and potentially open to collaborations in the future. You can learn and explore new skills. So throughout my PhD, I would never have, you know, learned how to do stand up comedy or how to edit videos. And now these are new, fun, creative skills that I have that I wouldn't have had otherwise. And also public engagement uh, is a really big on the agenda for universities and research institutions nowadays. So if you're thinking of pursuing an academic career, this kind of experience is really valuable for your CV. Um, so that's everything that I have to say. Um, feel free to email me if you have any questions. Um, and just to say that we are always looking for people to write blogs or co-create content like videos or podcasts for our website. We try to get as many voices as possible. So if you're interested in collaborating on our website, then please don't hesitate to get in touch about that either. Um, yeah, and that's everything I have to say. That's great, Naomi. Thank you. And thanks to all of our speakers today. Um, so I'm going to stop the recording there. Um,